goodness. All right. Well, hello everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to the Monterey Bay Aquarium live here on Twitch. Uh, my name is Emily S. Uh, we're going to figure out a way to distinguish this sometime during the stream today. But anyway, I'm a uh, part of the social media team here at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And this afternoon, I am joined by two wonderful people. One of them happens to be my colleague and coworker and good friend, Patrick. Patrick, how are you doing this afternoon? Hey, I'm doing fantastic. As you can see, I figured out how to emote in Animal Yay. Crossing. So there's me being very, very excited. <laughs> uh, this is Rick Etz is my character, named after famed biologist Ed Ricketts, wearing his rain hat because famously he hated getting his hair wet, even when he was taking a shower. So wearing my rain hat today to greet our very, very special guest here, joining us here in our field of California poppies, uh, Emily S., why don't you introduce our great, great guest who well, happens to be here today. We're so our, excited. Our other so guest excited. who is, I, I hope, just about as excited about this as, as we are this afternoon, happens to be, uh, <laughs> I, I can tell, uh, happens to be um, one of our friends and colleagues working over at the Field Museum. You may have heard of her before if you've ever watched an episode of The Brain Scoop or have seen anything coming out on social media from the Field Museum. She is amazing. We love her. We have Emily Grassley joining us this afternoon. Hey, Emily. Woo! Yay. Thanks for having me. So <laughs> We're excited. so excited. <laughs> I, and look at my character. I'm so cute. I designed my dress myself. Oh my God. It's excellent. Yeah, we, it yeah. Amazing. Yeah. It looks, it looks wonderful. I have my fish purse. I won this in the fish tourney yesterday. Oh, nice. I didn't so. wear mine today. I, I went with the uh, professional Julie Packard look here for Monty Ray. Um, I've got my little my little coat on and everything. Um, however, I, I was prepared for this situation here. Um, I got myself a fish wand oh, during the fish tourney. Yeah. So I've got some, some extra outfits that I, I, I now have now. Um, so I've got my, wow. my sweet, my sweet new nerd outfit on, um, which I'm pretty excited yeah, about. like what I normally wear. I know. I was just like, this feels right. <laughs> this feels comfortable. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so, you know, we can come, come out during, uh, uh, the stream here in, in many different outfits. I've got my birding outfit still. I did a little, little change up there. I've got... I've got my actual bird outfit ready to go. I know that this one is always a hit on stream. Oh, wow. um, I, I, I now also have uh, my leaf girl outfit too for exploring exploring the uh, the Animal Crossing wilderness, the the dangerous Sorry, world that it is. I don't have that capacity yet, so I, I just ran away <laughs> to the beach to go collect some uh, go collect some mussels, you know, rickets, <laughs> uh, habits, die hard. So uh, I might just go fishing or or, or something as I. That's um, okay. I feel like if if I don't have a fish in hand, I feel like maybe I uh, I'm not playing this game right. So that's been my Rickett's journey over here, trying to go find <laughs> try all the animals. Well, but you no, can get a fish going, and then everybody. just hold it just in case. Um, I mean, the good news for all of us here today is that we no longer have a, a chance of catching eggs. So I think that is a that's oh, a, a, a bonus so all around. I'm so glad about that. <laughs> But that we're not here to exciting. talk about eggs today. We are here to go on a wonderful scientific journey, um, giving a tour of our island to Emily. We're going to go fossil hunting with Emily. We're going to go talk about fossils with blathers in the museum. We're going to go on a little museum and aquarium tour. All in all, I think we're just going to have a good time here here today. And we've got so many people joining us in chat. We just want to say hello. Hello to all the new fronds over there. Um, and I'm just realizing now that I forgot to reset our pun counter, Patrick. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take care of that real quick. Okay. Um, hey, hey. Uh, and su super quick, Emily, too. Uh, I know we have a graphic for our, our visitor as well. So if oh, you that, that, to, I got, oh, I just forgot uh, to hit transition one. over on OBS. That was my yeah, bad. I no put worries. it up there. No, no, no worries. Uh -oh. This is our third stream, everybody. All streams lead to the ocean. <laughs> oh, my stream. goodness. Look there at that. Go. Look right above <laughs> you there, Emily. Look at your graphic. Yay. Yay. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Oh, you look so great. Got a little ammonite in there. Yay. All right, let me just That's so cool. take care that of this awesome. pun well, um, real quick. 
It is. It is so great to be able to uh, spend some time virtually with uh, with with both of you, Emily's here, especially as uh, our institutions are closed right now due to uh, COVID-19. We hope everyone who is watching us here in the chat is uh, doing as well as can be expected. We hope that you are staying safe and healthy out there. And uh, it's just really our pleasure to be able to bring you uh, some nerding out over natural history at a distance where you happen to be. So thank you so much for uh, being here, everyone. Yeah, 810 viewers in chat right now. This is definitely the biggest that we've been. <laughs> it is it definitely is the biggest to, that we've ever had. Did you already pun that one, our first one? Good to see you. Pun oh, count you equals know what? one hey. for the stream. So, so uh, Emily Grassley, if you have any uh, any puns for us, we will make sure to add them in the chat. That way we can keep track of our punnery uh, happening here on the stream. So uh, well, that is definitely going to be a little mini game going on there. Yeah, if we're here for fossils, then I dig it. Let's go. Yeah, Let's we go. are ready to Let's rock. Let's go. Let's yeah. go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, okay. So first of all, so we're going to go fossil hunting first. I think so. What do you think, chat? Should we go fossil hunting? All right. Well, I got to get my shovel ready. Um, I have not dug up any of the fossils on the island yet today. Um, so we can go exploring, looking for those. Um, we've done a little bit of maintenance since our last stream, too. Um, you can see that we've now added the aquarium logo outside of our museum. Um, if any of our, our creative team is oh, looking, wow. I Look apologize. I apologize. Yeah. It is not the official aquarium blue. But that was about as close as it was going to let me get there. So I can work on that later. <laughs> you know what? They can curse as much as they want because it's a hex color problem, right? Is that a good pun? Uh, Is that a good pun? It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. You miss every shot you don't take. So I'm going to put that one in the chat. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, which way do you want to go? What are? How about let's let Emmy, em, Emily decide. Uh, what? Are, which way are you feeling? Okay. This way. I don't know. I've never been here before. Welcome. Well, let's, let's go Welcome to Emily, Monterey and, and Bay. As we as we go, I've gone I've gone fossil hunting here uh, locally. There's a few areas that have um, some nice little shale beds with little crabs and stuff. But as an experienced fossil explorer, extraordinary yourself, and someone who assesses uh, fossils too, can you tell us a little bit about what it's like to fossil hunt in game versus fossil hunting? in the wild what is what, what what are some differences that that you may have noticed for the folks at home who may not have gone fossil hunting before oh well oh geez where to begin but one thing <laughs> i think that it's really interesting how prospecting for fossils and animal crossing is quite a bit different whereas like prospecting for fossils in real life is you'd want to walk along like a like a um a feature like this that has you know a stratigraphic column you can see the layers of rock and then you'd technically be able to see one coming out of the side of the snow that's not how it works in animal crossing in animal crossing there's literally an x marks the spot and you just put your shovel in so prospecting is a heck of a lot easier um i've got i've got to say nice Oh yeah, no, I've definitely enjoyed that particular feature uh, because I would not have the patience, I think, to uh, look at all the strata here in this in this side of the of the hill there. But if someone was looking for fossils out there in the wild, is that what they would want to look for? Some areas with some exposed layers? Yeah, I mean that's one good way of finding it, right? Because the the layers of rock on like a hillside stratified the oldest at the bottom, usually being or the rocks at the bottom usually being the oldest, and the rocks at the top usually being younger um and so if you know what age of oh why am i fishing all of a sudden <laughs> that was an accident <laughs> um so if you know what age of rock you're you're looking at um you you kind of know the age of the fossils that are in there um and and if you can see them like eroding out of the side then they're it's easier to find because then you don't have to like expose all that ground anyway or burn it all up off you know like if there's a lot of ground cover you won't be able to see the fossils in the in the ground that's okay. one difference well that so that's really that's that's very interesting already just like though there are some different features that you can use to try to uh, figure out where the where the fossils are. Um, just very quickly, maybe even going back a little bit further from where we just were talking about how to find a fossil, can you describe just very quickly, how does a fossil form and what, what would be considered a, a, a fossil here for the folks out there that are playing Animal Crossing, discovering these animals, 
buried in the ground. How, how, how did those fossils wind up under the ground there? Oh boy. Well, that's another great question. So let's go to the river. I'm let's go to the river. To the river. Take right. me to the river. Yeah. Oh yeah. We've <laughs> okay. talked to, there's millions of peaches, peaches for free. Millions of peaches, Yay. peaches. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so if I wanted to become a fossil right here in this game, I will fight dies here. That would be a pretty optimal place because in order for a fossil to form, um, the first step we always joke is number one, you have to die. Um, <laughs> the second step in forming a fossil uh, to ensure preservation is that you want to be uh, buried really quickly in sediment. And this is because as you, after you die, as you start to decompose, you're going to attract a lot of um, scavengers who are going to come and want to like take parts of you away and eat your arms and uh, your eyeballs and ants are going to like carry away all of your and all that stuff. Uh, and, and so the more pieces of you that get consumed or carried away, the less likely you are to have that material with, right? Because you've been eaten. Um, so if you can die near like a, a river or near a lake or the shore of a, an ocean, and if you can get buried really quickly, then you won't be scavenged away. And it also has the added benefit of, of getting covered in sediment. And uh, fossils form through really complex processes. It, it's a process called taphonomy, the study of fossilization. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, but anyway, there's... Yeah, so there's like a, a lot of complexities in terms of like nutrient cycling, and you have to die in an area that is optimized for fossilization. And then you have to wait like a couple of tens of millions of years and hope that your, you know, mineralized remains don't get crumpled up in a battling event. Uh, and then if you're lucky, you're going to be in a situation where, like, if I died down by this side of the river, and then uh, there was some sort of geologic uplift and there was a rift which put this land above the, the land where I died, well, then there's a chance that I might be exposed. And a paleontologist is going to walk along this cliff bottom and see part of my arm bone sticking out of the side of this hill. And then they're going to be like, huh, I wonder if the rest of it is in there. That it And uh, yeah, there you go. Every single aspect of that is is something that I love so much uh, is that I, I believe that under any other circumstances, any of those things happening would be considered a very, very unlucky thing. <laughs> but uh, for a fossil and for a fossil hunter, those are exactly the things that 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 you want to have happen. Um, so thank you so much for de describing that. That's that's a really exciting, a really exciting thing. I think that there's a couple of people in the chat that are saying, please, may I become a fossil when I grow up? So um, <laughs> that's certainly certainly something uh exciting there the other thing i want to ask um before we like maybe we should run around and go try to find one is a philosophical question does a fossil exist if someone uh doesn't find it who can recognize it as being an animal that used to be <laughs> on the planet before them like how much of the human experience is is uh is necessary for there to be such a thing as as fossils and discovery like that uh, that is a, that's a huge question. Um, <laughs> what it sort of gets into a, a deeper philosophical question of like what value does a fossil have inherently? Like if you're not going, oh here's one. Hey, whoa, hey, we found one. Hey, we did it. Um, yeah, when does um, when does it begin to achieve its value? Is it is it in the ground like where it's remained unseen by anything recognizable today for the last like couple hundred million years? Like where it remained forever or does it have a value once you excavate it and try and understand where it fits into the greater circle of life of which we're all connected i don't know i i love i love just having that question out there open for everybody in the chat there to to, to contemplate there uh for themselves like when when does a fossil have value and one thing that we do know is that in animal crossing you have a lot of value attached to fossils and especially we have our museum uh, curator blathers that uh really values the discovery of, of of fossils so we have already found one there um emily simpson do you have yeah. any uh any tips on finding fossils for folks who might be watching the game who might want to find their own fossil collecting uh you know uh, a few things about what time of day to go look for them we can find another one <laughs> well I, I mean the good news is uh, about what time of 
day to go look for fossils um, is that they are not nocturnal or or anything like that. They're going right. to be there all, all day long. So uh, don't have to worry about that that too much. Um, yeah, they're kept they're kept in the dark no matter what happens. right? <laughs> exactly. Well, I mean, it depends on the fossil, yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, like Emily was saying, you know, if if you have any kind of river nearby where there's been geologic activity where you have exposed cliff sides and 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 riverbanks and things like that that's always a great place to to go looking there um oftentimes there are going to be local fossil hunters in in your areas that might have a website or something that you can check out um and see if there are any places that um are known to have a lot of fossils um yeah you you just want to look for some of those um some of those spots where it's going to be easier to find them. I know like in, in Arizona, there's literally a place called Fossil Creek. Um, so that's that's where, uh, you know, we would go sometimes to go fossil hunting in Arizona. was oh, like going to Fossil Creek. So is Fossil Creek one where the fossils need uh, a little bit of a um, little bit of lubricant in their joints? They're feeling a little bit creaky. <laughs> is that? Hey. Yes. Sorry, I had to shoehorn one in there because I haven't used the puns uh, expression here in uh, short amount of time. In a while, we're up to yeah. eight. We're Oof. up to eight. Oh, oh and we're only, over a thousand viewers eight. right oh now. Thank gosh. you so much, everyone, for tuning in. By the that way, you are just joining us. My name is my name is Patrick. Uh, I work at the Aquarium Social Media. Uh, I'm the one with the hat. Uh, currently with the shovel is Emily. Emily, Hello. how's it going? Oh, that well, one of the Emilys we should say. So this is Emily yeah, from sorry, the Monterey Emily Bay Simpson, Aquarium. Yes. Yeah, Emily, Emily from the aquarium is the one with the glasses and the shovel. And then we are joined by Emily Grassley hanging onto her ladder right there with this sweet dress and glasses on right now. Uh, she's joining us from uh, the Field Museum, or I should say, from her house. Uh, that's where yeah. all of us are right now. So uh, we've got. Patrick joining in on a call from his house across the bay from me. Um, there's me a couple miles away from Patrick and then us a couple uh, hundred, if not about a thousand miles away from Emily, who is joining us from her house on a call right now. So yeah. Animal Crossing bringing, bringing us nerds together from thousands bringing of miles of away. Us. It's Absolutely, a, and we're so thing. we're so grateful uh, for uh, for Emily Grassley to take some time uh, out of her busy schedule to come and play some Animal Crossing and help us understand how fossils work. How um, we're going to have lots of discussion once we head inside the museum. Right now, we're sort of on a fossil hunt, but if you are just tuning in here to the stream, uh, once this becomes available on VOD, uh, there will be a great discussion about how to find fossils, where fossils tend to be, how fossils form. Uh, so we've already gone through uh, a lot of just what makes a fossil, uh, and um, that's a big part of the Animal Crossing experience is to uh, go look for those fossils around your island to see what biodiversity there used to be uh, around here. Um, uh, let's see, Emily G, do you have anything to add about just the fossil exploration aspect? Any any uh, hot takes about about it as we as we go through trying to find the rest? Well, one thing, I kind of mentioned it earlier when we were talking about how you find fossils in real life. And I mentioned that normally, like from a geologic perspective, I would be standing, um, uh, if you're looking from the bottom up, you can look, tend to see rocks that are older at the bottom and younger rocks at the top. And this obviously varies where you are geologically. But one thing about the island geology I find pretty interesting is that so far I have found fossils of organisms that represent a period of time of more than 500 million years. Wow. It's like, like the, uh, the history of all life on Earth, um, uh, you know, multi, um, multi uh, cellular life, I should say, um, over the last 500 million years based on the fossils that you find. But the interesting thing is there's no stratigraphic continuity here so like you're finding 500 <laughs> million year old fossils in the same stratigraphic layer as the fossil that's only a hundred thousand years old it doesn't make any sense and emily you're <laughs> so. running you're running across the beach just <laughs> expressing that frustration spinning around in circles it really can make a, a a fossil collector mad just what what the game mechanic has done to the fossil <laughs> hunting true, these though. strata are not the same <laughs> You have... I know they're not the same. So if I find a fossil down here and I think, okay, well, these rocks are 500 million years old. The fossil is that old. But then if I find a younger fossil in the older rocks, it throws off my 
stratigraphy, and then the U.S. Geological Survey is going to be confused, and then future geologists are, are not going to know what to do. We, we can't have that kind of inconsistency in the scientific record uh, just if we I want know. to be a truly uh, inadequate fossil hunting simulator that, that we have here. So uh, <laughs> you're, on, you're on notice, Nook Inc. Get yourself some, some islands that have uh, <laughs> adequate stratification of their fossils, please. We just, we beg of you. I know. We've paid you a lot please. of money. We're paying you back slowly. That's the least you could do. <laughs> I, I think I, they have all of your money. Yeah, they do have all, 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 of, my, all of my debt belongs to Tom Nook. I read a meme, or I saw a meme on the internet that was like, Tom Nook is just a loan shark. And I was like, it's so true. It's true, yeah. Ooh. Rick and Rick, my Rickette's ears just picked up. There's a another species of shark on the island that we can potentially bring to the Natural History Museum. That's exciting. I think yeah, that's another pun. I, I, that I tried really one. hard. I'm, I'm yeah. sorry. Thanks, everyone. Uh, well, <laughs> hey, uh, both, both Emily is just looking at the chat. There's a lot of folks that are talking about how great the museum is here at the aquarium we found uh we found i think two fossils here um maybe it's time to go uh take a look at the at the monterey bay island natural history museum that uh yeah. that we have yeah. here and start thinking about that that animal collection let's do it all right i'll go in <laughs> oh boy oh this is so exciting in we go i got stuck in the doorway there we go <laughs> welcome I put my tools away. Oh, wait. There, it's so funny. Everybody, there are people in the chat defending Tom Nook. They're like, he's he doesn't put any interest on his <laughs> That's true. Right. Hey, That's know? true. Hey, That's hey, true. Hey, you gotta <laughs> listen. We, we totally, totally understood. We said it was a hot take. We said it was a hot take. Once we have a cool, <laughs> once we have a cool, calm and collected take, we'll let you know. But that was the hot take. There's no interest, but but I'm just gonna say this. He adds one room to the house for like you know 250,000 bells but then the next room that's the same size all of a sudden is 750,000 bells something fishy is happening there so something yeah. very fishy is happening <laughs> and you have to go fishing to pay it off so i guess that makes sense yep i feel um, like the whole system there's just like it's just ripe for money laundering across the board <laughs> let's not even get into the unsustainability of the wildlife trade here in the game it's... Oh, certainly not. And especially in a, in a post-Tiger King world, we really want to <laughs> avoid that particular topic of exactly what's going on here. We're, we're, we're just going to live in the world where we're finding cool animals and we're learning about them. And so that's why we're at the museum right now. That's very, yeah, let's keep it. There we go. Keep it there. Perfect. <laughs> All right. So, um, uh, Emily G, uh, just very quickly, as you've walked through the museum at the, at the aquarium, it looks like we're going to get one of our fossils assessed right now. Um, does it remind you of the Field Museum uh, when, when you're in here? Do you, do you think that any of the artists got some uh, inspiration from visiting uh, your type of, of institution? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think one of the most interesting things about uh, everybody playing this right now is that there's a lot of us museum folk who are, like, turning to Animal Crossing to get our, our museum vibe. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's cool because for rarer fossils, and we can talk about this too, um, in the Hall, um, the rare fossils like uh, Dunkley Osteus that they have on display here, um, there haven't been as many of these actual fossils found. And so museums will make like high quality, you know, museum quality replicas. Uh, and so we have like a, a Dunkley Osteus at the Field Museum that looks uh, really similar to the model that they use here in the game. And that's uh, the same for like the coelacanth. Uh, yeah. and a number of other uh, other um, models. And so that's been, like, really interesting. And, and so you see these stuff, and you're like, ah, I have one of these in my museum. That's awesome. Yeah, we've seen a lot of similarities in the exhibit design of the aquarium portion of uh, the Natural History Museum here on the island uh, because it's set up in terms of habitats and ecosystems of animals. So you have collections of animals based off of their ecology, which was really... Uh, sort of a unique characteristic of the Monterey Bay Aquarium when it opened up in 1984. It was based off of the habitat path that Ed Ricketts laid out in the inner title in his Between Pacific Tides uh, book, which was a, a field guide, an ecology textbook that many of the founders of the aquarium were reading when they were in, in college learning, their, uh, learning their, their marine biology. And so that's why when you come to the aquarium, there's an open sea wing, there's a nearshore wing, there's a kelp forest exhibit, uh, habitats 
of uh, the Monterey Bay, like the shale reef, et cetera. So it's not like uh, this exhibit with put all the sharks over here, put all the birds over here. It's, it's really spread out so that people have an understanding of the ecology and the larger world of where the animals live, which was really one of the aspects playing Animal Crossing. We're like, oh my goodness, these animals have an ecology on the island. And then when they're at the aquarium uh, in the museum, they're really set up in the same way. So getting a lot of the same vibes uh, going to the aquarium and they have a kelp forest and a deep sea uh, exhibit, which is truly exciting. That's what we love here uh, at the Monterey Bay Aquarium is, yeah. is those two, the kelp forest, the deep sea, something we know very well here in Monterey Bay. Exactly. So, yeah, very exciting to come visit. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you can Emily see that Simpson. on screen there, but we've got a mega syrup. Uh, oh my gosh, I can't even talk right now. A mega <laughs> syrup skull. Woo! Woo Yay! Yay. Woo what a hoot. Well, exciting. bad news is that we already have one. Good news is oh, that no. now we okay. have two. <laughs> now we have two. Now we Perfect. have two. Um, let's assess the other one. Then we'll, we can see what Blathers has to say about these uh, these fossils as well. Um, and then we're going to see what Emily has to say about these fossils too. So, I'm so excited for this. I've actually never been to the Field Museum myself. Um, and so I'm just so very wonderful. excited to see a little get a little insight uh of the type of knowledge that i'm missing out on hopefully once all this is lifted can head out over there and take a closer look yeah i if if it uh i'm gonna embarrass myself on on stream here um uh -oh. but when i went to the field museum uh, uh quite a few years probably almost a decade ago when i went uh but uh, they had a fossil specimen there that I had just read about in a book called Your Inner Fish. Um, mm. And yeah, the, the tiktal I, I'm going to butcher the name of it, but I, I always pronounce it Tiktolic. Tiktolic? I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, tiktolic. Yeah, Tiktolic. Okay. Phew. <sighs> um, but I had just read about it in a book. I was taking ichthyology at the time and I went there and I got to see it like in person and I stood there with my book and just shed tears in front of it because I was so excited to like see it in person uh, so that was my field yeah. museum experience that's not embarrassing <laughs> that's the most endearing thing you've said about a fossil Aww. that's amazing yeah. that's lovely everyone should be brought to tears when they look at a fossil of a shared common ancestor <laughs> yeah can no you can you do we're all fish can we can we describe more uh tectilic just there's a few questions there um what 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 is that animal specifically? So it's a uh, kind of a bridge between uh, fish and and uh, land animals. Um, so you have all of these kind of transitionary animals. Um, you know these fossils that we've seen going from fish living in the ocean to that movement to life on land. And uh, Tiktaalik happened to be kind of one of those missing links right there. Um, it's T I K T A A L I K Tiktaalik. Um, yeah, we've got a we've got a spelling contest in chat right now going on. Yeah, uh, yeah, a lot of people are <laughs> nailing it there. That's awesome. Nailed it. Yeah. Um, the, the fish a pot. As yeah. People are calling it. <laughs> <laughs> and as uh, someone who just um, one absolutely loves fish and was studying them in college at the time, and um, who loves evolution and and evolutionary biology. Um, which is what I ended up getting my degree in. Um, it was just really cool to have that like concrete piece of, of science in front of me um, that that shows like, hey, like that's that's our origin. Like that's where we came from. Um, so yeah, and anyway, that was my that no, was awesome. my uh, existential some that... like moment there. <laughs> Absolutely. And people people are mentioning that, uh, you know, the continued evolution of TikTok has led to TikTok lick uh, oh, for the Generation hey, Z hey, that, that's going to yeah. be going on there. So, uh, <laughs> you know, if, if it could dance, it's one of the first fish that could dance on land. Um, uh, you know, it could have been a, a TikTok star. So there we go. My way of bookending your wonderfully, wonderfully sweet and heartwarming 
Um, it's what we do here on stream. Story. Yeah. And then me just stepping on that with a terrible, <laughs> terrible joke. I'm so sorry, Emily. That's okay. <laughs> uh, Blathers here is having a moment talking about pteranodons. So um, it's pretty cute. Uh, <laughs> he just, as much as he wishes that he could see, he could have seen a, a pteranodon flying. I wish that I could have seen a, a little tectolic doing like little push ups in the water there with his, his big lobe fins. Yeah, so. Um, anyway, <laughs> I get, I get carried away when I talk about fossils to blathers. Don't worry. Um, yeah, all right. Same. All right. Let's see here. Right. Do we want to see what he has to say about the megaserps first, or do we want to talk about pteranodons first, or do we just want to go and head down to our fossils? What are we, what are we feeling team? Let's go to the fossils. I think. All right. You yeah. know what blathers? I'm fine. Yeah. Thank you. There she goes. And Emily's off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my All right, Emily. This is uh, Emily Grassley. Both Emily's. Mm. I'm, just, I'm just here along for the ride. <laughs> I am I am Ricketts here. Uh, I'm all about fishes. Tell me about these these fossils here. Take it. Well, you away. know this one now. over here on the on the left, Patrick. This is what you are so oh, yeah. excited oh, we about. Know, we know ammonites for sure. We're all about mollusk mayhem here on the <laughs> on the stream. Um, oh yeah. But uh, Emily, uh, Emily G, introduce us to to this little walkway here. What what uh, what type of fossils do we have in here? Oh boy. Well, one thing that I really love about this is the minute that the, I first walked into this part of the museum in my game, it like brought me to the field museum because. The way that this display is set up is technically back here at the very beginning, you're starting at the oldest common ancestor of all living things, and then you get these little tendrils that sort of like branch off to either side, and they, they're color-coded, and you see like this beautiful evolutionary tree that is like has these little stops along the way, and, and each stop is peppered with a fossil find. So that's really cool because like this is a, a mechanism that museums use all over the world when they're building these deep time halls. Um, like the one at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C., they just reopened their new deep time hall, and they did the reverse. So they actually start in, like, present day and go further back in the fossil record. So one way or another, you're looking at the oldest fossil material that you'll find on your island in Animal Crossing in this first exhibit area. But one thing that... It, one of the sticking points is you pointed out this beautiful ammonite on the left, and it is so cool, but what, my thing is that ammonites lived for, you know, you can find them in the fossil record for like 300 million years, mm -hmm. and you, it's so long, right? So it's like, is this a 300 million year old ammonite fossil, really? Or is this like one from the Cretaceous, like 66 million years old? So there's not quite, a, there's not enough information about it. Oh, yeah, no, if or it's I'm coming like, from the Cretaceous, I don't. They throw it out. Doesn't belong. Get me <laughs> one three hundred million years ago. That's yeah. You know, the like, older the better. It, it kind of looks like a Cretaceous age ammonite species to me, but I'm not the I'm not the cephalopod person here, so maybe <laughs> not. But for sure, like that mosquito back in amber, I'm a little dubious about. Right? Like, I know mosquitoes are a little bit older, but the first flowering plant didn't evolve until 130 million years ago. So I'm thinking that this can't be that old. Oh, that's interesting. But, yeah. yeah, but I don't know. I you do like to see an you do like to see a museum that has a mosquito in amber because it means that they've spared no expense. Um, oh gosh. Yeah. See. Perfect. <laughs> I'm on Soon. brand as always. Well, okay. Sorry. Keep, keep are we going gonna, with real real stuff. I'll I'll sit over here. Are in the we corner. gonna be able to get some uh, dino DNA out of its tummy and then? Yeah. Not how that works. <laughs> oh no! I've been there are no there are no frogs <laughs> in here that we can combine the DNA with. So, then. well, the uh, that's not... two things I'll I'll point out like the the Dunkleosteus like that we've got a model like that at the Field Museum, so that's really cool to see. That's a Devonian fish, like three hundred million years old. And then the Helicoprion, the the shark whorl, like that's really neat too. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I like the little tidbit that Blather shares about it, which is that their skeletons were made of cartilage, uh, so they didn't fossilize. And so you think about, like, the ancient lineage of sharks and how sharks have been around, and ancient sharks have, you know, they've been able to survive all the six major mass extinction events on planet history. It's amazing! But, like, how far back did they go? We don't know because they didn't fossilize! Ah! <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, the, the conundrum of the evolutionary understanding of of the of the phylogenetic tree. No, I get well, you. I mean, it can it can make one mad. So many different it, animals like that have not fossilized. Like uh, like comb jellies are another exactly. great example. There's yeah. always a battle oh, yeah. between the comb jelly people and the and the sponge people as to who's the more uh, basal on the phylogenetic tree. And uh, oh, it's really that. it's really difficult to know because um, so many of those animals really didn't fossilize. But the thing about comb jelly is that people keep finding is that they have genes that no other animals have that do the same thing that that are um, that that we do. The whole lineage from sponges leading up to us, they have the same genetic code for how to replicate your DNA. And then for some reason, the, the for some reason, the the comb jellies were just like, yeah, you know, you can actually do it slightly different. And so they do. And so they have different genetic markers for where your head and your butt goes than uh, than the rest of animal life. And so that's why everyone's like, okay, well, so is our sponges more ancient? Our comb jellies more ancient? Where do they come from? And as best as people can tell from the soup that gave life, there were two different uh, routes to take. Road less traveled is the one that the comb jellies took, but we really can't know because so few of them fossilized. So yeah, yeah I mean, I mean wow. that's another. Yeah. yeah. You think about how much life on our planet now is gelatinous and these gelatinous animals that are all over the ocean and you know you don't see the fossil record of that because none of them were really able to fossilize and so what we have this picture of in our heads of these prehistoric oceans just filled with ammonites and and mollusks and and you know some of these awesome fishes yeah it's not right yeah it's not right no. you know you have to include that gelatinous life in there yeah you know, I, there was a statistic. So we're, I'm actually, I'm working on a CBS series right now about paleontology that's coming out this summer. Um, if people want to tune in, everybody loves PBS, right? It's called Prehistoric Road Trip. It's going to be out um, in a couple months. But anyway. Woo! Uh, so I, yeah, woo! We got Prehistoric Road Trip, like and subscribe. <laughs> yeah! Tune in to PBS. <laughs> Donate to your station. Um, <laughs> so... So one thing that we learned while working on the show is that 99% of all of the fish that ever existed on the planet has gone extinct. Wow. Say that again. I'm sorry. It's 99% of all life that has ever existed. 99% of all species. Is wow. Extinct, right? Wow. So only 1% of all of the biodiversity that's ever lived on our planet is alive today right now. So, of course, there are so many, like, jellies and squishy things and that we don't even know about that's so oh my goodness ah! that's so crazy to think about <laughs> yeah it, it's it's maddening absolutely maddening that's amazing that yeah. that is a, i had not i had not heard that exact statistic that that's exactly how much how much was left wow yeah isn't that wild that is wild. it is um, yeah yeah, and we and you asked, you know, if we're fans of PBS, we absolutely love uh, the PBS team. We were so excited when they were over here for Big Blue Live when they did their live uh, show from our back deck. They're looking at blue whales and um, and humpback whales and all of this amazing life that that's in the Monterey Bay. And it's really, you know, if you go diving in the Monterey Bay, there's thousands of species that you'll see. It feels like you'll see a uh, hundred species on one rock. Uh, so to think that we're missing 99% of all of the other species. There's so many animals that we really don't even know about, and we don't even have all of the species that are currently around categorized. Uh, I might have to find a bench here in this museum and sit down and just kind of think for a minute. That's uh, that's I pretty know. heavy to think about. Yeah. That is pretty heavy to bring up in an Animal Crossing live stream. Yeah, you thought Animal Crossing was just a kid's game. Just, We're getting yeah. deep philosophical over here. Monty yeah. Ray is having like an existential crisis right now, just staring off in surprise. Yeah. I love it. I, also, All right. I want to give a shout out in the chat. Someone, said, um, someone from the water quality department at your aquarium is there. And I think that's so good. That's, that's awesome. So, oh, the, really? That's so awesome. Water quality who are like taking care of all the critters. Yes. Oh, yay. yay. We yay. love you. For those people. Absolutely. Oh, oh no. So... Don't worry. Don't. You, we can. You can. Yeah. We can have them on. They they wanted to be invited. Yeah, let's do a yeah. let's do an Animal Crossing stream with all of you. I would love that. Absolutely. Talking about animal or talking about water quality. Yes. Yeah, I'd yeah. love to. Yes. Uh, I'm uh, oh, everybody in the chat right now is saying we stand the water quality lab. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, team water quality. Team water quality. What's yes. in your water? What's in your water? <laughs> 
well. Oh, uh, that's really awesome. Uh, uh, as a transition from that topic over into the next room, do you want a really uh, ham-handed uh, Jurassic Park joke related to comb jellies? Yes. Okay. So one of the things that our comb jelly aquarists have learned about uh, working with comb jellies is that they are an organism that have amazing uh, repair uh, capability on their bodies. They can get damaged in ways that most other animals cannot and still repair themselves. Uh, and in the genus Nemeopsis, the comb jellies, um, they're a lobed comb jelly. What, they, what people have found is that uh, if you dice them up, uh, whichever part is still holding on to both anal pores, um, comb jellies have two, have two anal pores, uh, whichever part still has those two anal pores, as long as it's about a tenth of the size of the, of the jelly, they can regrow their entire body from that particular segment there that still has the, the anal pores. And so it's basically exactly like what Samuel Jackson says in uh, Jurassic Park. Uh, if you want to be a Nemeopsis comb jelly and you're trying to survive out there, just hold on to your butts. Ah! Voila! Anal, anal pore. That's the name of my new metal band. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Voila. Hey guys, welcome to anal pore. This is I know, everybody. That was, comb jelly. <laughs> that was a long walk for that punchline, but we made it. And now we're in another long walk into the next room over. Uh, can you folks, uh, the Emily's, introduce us to this magnificent fossil collection These here? Are... We've moved on from the ocean. These and are we're... Monty Ray's fossils. BT Dubs, if yeah. you didn't know, stand on the blue dot, and then you can see all of your fossils, and you can see the impending doom up there in the top, uh, top, top left. Of course, our names are covering it right now. Hold on, I'll move those real quick so that everybody can enjoy this this scene. I had no idea you could actually set up your camera to do this. I didn't yeah, know that here. at all. Well, I'll cool. move off of that so that Emily can see it too. Emily, go ahead and stand on the blue dot. Oh, oh shoot! It's going <laughs> away. Well, it's so here's good. My biggest hype is that you've got again 230 million years of vertebrate fossils represented in this room, and we only know conclusively of one major asteroid impact that resulted in a mass extinction, and it wasn't all of the mass extinction. Like the Permian end mass extinction that wiped out Dimetrodon over here, which is not a dinosaur, but is an early proto mammal. Yes. It's an apsid. It's more closely related to you than it is to any dinosaurs. This got wiped out in the Great Dying, which wiped out 97% of all life on Earth. The Permian, like 150 million years before the other dinosaurs got wiped out. Whoa. And what yeah. was what was what was the cause of the Permian extinction again? That wasn't that wasn't the one with the volcanoes uh, and the lava flows in in Siberia, was it? No, that was something. Different. It was like everything. It was like I, it was this huge. Uh, geologists think it was like a. Well, I'm trying to think a, a, a consortium isn't the right word, but a, a tremendous amount of like climate change and maybe volcanoes and all sorts of stuff going on. Wow. Uh, that resulted in, in extinction. But yeah, the Permian end mass extinction event was, was a couple hundred million years ago. Was um, it something yeah. that was it something so, that Dimitrodon said? What like the, did they have like really harsh opinions or something? And then it was just like a smiting that happened by the planet, just like, okay, <laughs> no, we can't have this go around and then ninety seven percent of other animals went along with. Yeah, pretty much. I That's think what I, yeah. just, like too much universal snark going <laughs> Well, they led to us in this stream. Yeah. That's cool. I like I recall a lot because it is pretty recent of, like, other natural history museums. You've got, like, your big sauropods, your big long neck yeah. dinosaurs over here. Um, I'm a fan of Archelon, that they put an Archelon turtle yes. fossil over here because this is representative or represents the largest turtle species they think ever lived on the planet. And so there's a really great Archelon fossil on display in the Yale Peabody Museum. And it only had three flippers because one of the flippers was eaten by an ancient shark. Whoa. They, yeah, they can tell that it had, like, gotten bitten off and healed in life. And it wasn't something that happened after, afterwards. So that's kind of cool. Do we know if it was a type of uh, tiger shark? I know that tiger sharks have specialized teeth that's... Uh, or like a can opener for uh, for a turtle shell. I, do, do we know what kind of shark people are saying? I in have the chat? no shark? idea. Okay. I don't know what kind of shark it was. Kind mm. of shark, mm. shark ate my fins. Could have been a uh, shark. So Could have been a shark. We don't know. Okay. 
The other cool thing Sorry. about Archelon is that it was one of the fossils, or actually the one that's on display at Yale, was discovered by a guy named George Wheeland, um, who went on to become obsessed with fossil cycads. Whoa. Yeah, and there, and so all of this material was found in Western South Dakota. It's also really cool. Like me and Archelon would have been neighbors seven sixty-seven million years ago. Um, wow. Which is neat. Like, hey, buddy. Um, but Wheeland <laughs> got obsessed with fossil cycads that were found in the Black Hills, and it was actually like the only fossil cycad site in the Western United States that, that had been discovered at the time. It was like the 1910s. And he got so obsessed with these fossil cycads that he dug them all up and took them back to Yale. They were going to turn a national, turn it into like a national monument, fossil cycad national monument. Uh, but when the National Park Service showed up to like start building a visitor center, there were no more fossil cycads left because Wheeland had taken all of them. <laughs> Every one. And so then, yeah, every one. So they're like, well, never mind. And so they like, it's one of the only national monuments that they've now made defunct. Because they're like, well, there's no point now, Wheeland. <laughs> wow. They should rename it to the Wheeland Ruins Everything uh, National Monument, right? <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's like George Wheeland got greedy National Monument. Never mind, future Americans. Like, you don't get to have your special fossil site head place in western South Dakota. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> wow. I had, I had no idea Just... about any of that. That is, that is really... Wow, uh, a park could have happened, and then someone was just a little bit too obsessed, and then it didn't happen. That's that's a new one. Well, wow. the greatest irony is that Wheeland was the one who campaigned for Fossil Cycad National Monument. <laughs> like, that's the whole, he was like, this needs to be protected. Wow. And they're like, okay, we'll do it. And then they show up, and they're like, wait, Wheeland. And then he's like, BRB, I'm going to die now. And then he died, and his wife had all these, <laughs> like, Cycads in her backyard. So they went back to Yale. <laughs> oh my goodness oh my gosh hey can we get so, some can we get some f's in the chat for uh for the cycad national monument that could never happen <laughs> f's in the chat good job wheeland oh my goodness oh, wow yeah. hey some there. oh look at all the f's <laughs> look at oh, all thank of you them. everybody there we go wow it's getting hey. the respect wow. it deserves right now <laughs> oh it's paying paying respects to the cycad national monument uh, and in oh this gosh. in this moment of the F's in the chat, uh, just welcome everyone. If you are just tuning in to this live stream of Animal Crossing here with the Monterey Bay Aquarium social media team, uh, I'm Patrick. We've got Emily Simpson over on the uh, aquarium side, and we've got Emily Grassley, special guest, tuning in from uh, the Chicago area. Uh, and uh, Emily Grassley, of course, of the Field Museum and the Brain Scoop. And that's what you're watching right now is us exploring uh, the... Uh, the fossils and the natural history museum that we have here in animal crossing so thanks so much for tuning in everyone okay and now a word from our sponsors no, i'm just kidding uh okay now uh yeah back this... to the, back, back to the the fossils everybody yeah that was a could you say yeah. that the the word from our fossils was a, a, a fossil alarm there oh it was a fossil alarm hey hey uh, yes uh, oh yeah nailed it <laughs> one count 18 pretty low oh, pretty low but so i don't low think we're keeping track today okay We'll work on that. The, here's a, this other one next to Archelon, our turtle friend. This is a, another favorite. This is Tepaquatalus. It's the best. Which is super cool. Oh, it's, yeah. Um, yeah, it's the largest flying reptile ever. But what blows me away about Tepaquatalus is that it's only known from one of its arm bones. That's all that's been found in the actual fossil. Really? Um, in, yeah, in Texas. And so the, the paleontologists out in the 70s were prospecting in one of the parks in, in Texas. I can't remember the name uh, at the moment, but uh, they ended up finding just like the upper arm bone, the humerus, and then the, the radius ulna part of the arm, and I think a couple of other limb bones. But then they, they realized that they belonged to this giant flying pterosaur, and then based on, like, uh, uh, proportionality, like being able to extrapolate the bodily portions of smaller species of pterosaurs that were more complete, that had more of their bones, they, they were able to come up with these hypothetical models of how large the 
animal would have been. And then you get this huge giraffe size pterosaur, which is amazing. But now the big question is, well, it was so big. What was the atmospheric density of the earth during the time of the Cretaceous that would have allowed, like, would it have been able to fly? Oh. Like, was the atm- yeah, was the atmospheric pressure on earth less or more than it is today? And would that been able have, would that been like factored into the ability of this animal to fly or not? Kind of wow. Wild. That's, that's fascinating. I had no idea about, about any of, about any of that. So thoughts that maybe it was, it was denser back in the day or like wh- yeah. which direction would it need to go for it, it to be able to, go to fly? Denser, yeah. To be able to support. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's the atmospheric uh, pressure is related to like the level of gravity on Earth, right? <laughs> and, there, and there's some sort of like relation there. Um, and the answer to that is like I don't know. I'd have to look it up again because it's been a long time since I've looked into it. Somebody in the yeah, chat okay. mentioned it was Big Ben <laughs> National Park, so Big thank ben, you for yeah. that. Yeah, and someone, uh, someone. I was no, just go gonna it, say it. My, my favorite comment so far has been we love a, a giraffe goose um which is the best nickname I've ever heard for Quetzalcoatl before in my life because they were they were like the size of a giraffe so it's hard to you know get that sense of scale here in Animal Crossing when you're standing next to it but these things were huge yeah they were so big and I'm always like, this head was so large, but its body is so small. How did it fit the food in, the well, body? <laughs> that is, I mean, that's the opposite problem um, that Stegosaurus had, where its head was very tiny and its body was so, so big. Um, fun it's fact true. about Stegosaurus, I actually still remember a song that my preschool teachers taught me about Stegosaurus when I was younger. I'm not going to embarrass myself on Switch or not Switch on Twitch by singing it, but uh, there is a Stegosaurus song out there that talks about how its body is too big for its head. It had that tiny, tiny little nugget of a head, and it is my favorite dinosaur in the world. Yeah, there's are pretty cool. There, there are a lot of natural history uh, books I would say you know um, that have been written with Stegosaurus, where Stegosaurus really gets dunked on in the afterlife uh, for <laughs> having such a small head. <laughs> um, but uh, one of the most obviously charismatic of the of the dinosaurs for sure. Um, yes. I just wanted to, to point out uh, one of my favorite comments that went by in chat was someone was asking what the airspeed velocity of an unladen Quetzalcoatlus <laughs> was. I just think that that's an amazing question that only you know the greater minds of science uh, so wise uh, in the ways of science would be able to. I guess our question back that, our but. question back to them would then be African or European. So yeah. Right. Exactly. You know, it doesn't matter where you where you grip the food. It's how you get it into your body. That's the real question. Okay, sorry about that. Someone um, else in chat knows yes. the Stegosaurus song. Yes, yes. That's great. I'm not alone in the world. <laughs> I really uh, and, want you to sing it. Uh, uh, how about if I like if I were like word rap it, just because I don't I don't feel like singing. Yeah, just just spoken right. word. Yeah, okay. just spoken, yeah, spoken word. word. It. Spoken word. It. We'll, yeah, we'll spoken word this. Okay. Um, Here, I'll start, I'll start, I'll start clapping. No. <laughs> my name is Stegosaurus. I'm a funny looking dinosaur. Along my back are many bony plates and on my tail there's more. My front two legs are very short. My back two legs are long. My body's big. My head is very small. I'm put together wrong. My name is Stegosaurus. I'm a funny looking dinosaur. <laughs> Along my back are many bony plates and on my tail there's more. Sometimes another dinosaur comes by and wants to fight. I don't use fists. Instead, I use my tail. It has four sharp, sharp spikes. The end. Wow. Can we Aww. get some W's yeah. in the chat? W's I got in the snaps chat, everybody. In the, yeah, snaps in the chat. Yeah. Let's get, oh my goodness, some claps, some snaps, some W's. Oh my goodness. I don't, Look at that outpouring. I don't Great know job, what Emily. other important information that I should know. Um, yeah. has been replaced by the Stegosaurus song that I have held on to for decades now. Uh, but there you go. <laughs> that is, uh, that's apparently what my brain thinks is important. And I, gr- I agree with it, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Like certain crucial phone numbers. Line. Yeah, that deserves a line on your CV. <laughs> <laughs> Can awkwardly CV, sing about Stegosaurus. Yes. <laughs> My CD. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, 
Any anything else uh, in, in here that we want to point out? One yeah. of the few fo one of the few fossil facts that I know about uh, Triceratops or other um, of these dinosaurs that have the the classic three horns there is that there were many species of uh, of that type of dinosaur that I learned when I was a kid, and then uh, recently came out that many of those species. Were actually um, were actually just uh, young versions of the uh, adults, and so they were neotonic uh, versions, or um, uh, basically baby versions of these dinosaurs that were being found that were being called completely separate species. And then someone did some bone density analyses on uh, on them and discovered, well, no, these ones are younger ones because their bones aren't fully formed, and then uh, these ones are the adult ones. And so uh, that was something that I found out recently um, when I was just looking into dinosaurs like oh i need to update yeah. my taxonomy because there's lots of updates that have happened since i was a kid yes yeah that's awesome yeah. so uh in, in my tv show that's coming out this summer we went to the histology lab where they figure that out yeah yeah so we went to the museum of the rockies in bozeman um where they do paleohistology with triceratops and two of the species that you're talking about too are both found in the hell creek there's triceratops Porosis and Triceratops fortis, and one is found in lower in the column, the stratigraphic column. So they're separated by about 100 million years, but it's thought that uh, one was able to evolve into the other one. And so there was like this really interesting um, speciation that was actually, uh, you can see in the school record in that part of the Hell Creek formation, which is super dope. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, another Yay. one of those uh, kind of debates that has always gone on has been with the the sauropods here um i remember when i was a kid there was that whole like there's no such thing as a brontosaurus everything is an apatosaurus but it was pretty recent wasn't it like 2015 like only like five years ago um that they figured out that brontosaurus is actually a, a unique uh, genus of, of dinosaur after all that that there are brontosaurus and not all of them are apatosaurus so brontosaurus has been vindicated and so my, my yes my, bring it back yeah. <laughs> so there's just so much still out there you know when we're talking about these fossils I think one of my favorite things about um, you know paleontology and, and studying all these uh, amazing things is just the fact that you know even though they're are fossils that are hundreds and hundreds of millions year million years old that we still don't know everything about them you know that even though that oh, absolutely. you know <laughs> they're they've been around for a very long time we've been around you know in the blink of an eye here uh so there's still so much out there for us to know about them and so all these debates that we have about you know triceratops and brontosaurus versus apatosaurus and everything uh who knows what we're gonna find out tomorrow Oh, yeah. I think that's awesome. I mean, when you put everything into perspective, like the field of Western paleontology as a whole has really only been around for 150 years. And when you think about the fact that like long necked sauropod dinosaurs lived the entirety of the Mesozoic, you know, period of like 150 million years, like the chances that all of the species that ever lived were like represented all, in the fossil yeah. record <laughs> and those, that part of the fossil record is like now exposed is unlikely and then on top of that like there's just humans have hundreds of more years of scientific work to be done on all the things that we already know about um nevertheless the stuff that hasn't been discovered yet or on earth which i think is super cool too yeah absolutely the other thing i want to point out is that this classic like t-rex versus triceratops pose is so classic it's, it's, it's the sort of thing that um, was first imagined by early paleo artists like Charles Knight in uh, 1930s, sort of doing this like triceratops predator versus prey face off. And it's been reflected in popular media all across the board uh, in so many like uh, early dinosaur artworks and uh, movies like Fantasia, the original Fantasia, there's that famous mm -hmm. scene. Although I think they switched the triceratops with a stegosaurus which is weird because those animals were separated by like 75 million years. They've never <laughs> lived at the same time. Oh, whoa. Um, yep. Yeah. So like the Stegosaurus and the tri and the T-Rex are super wrong, but tri Triceratops and T-Rex probably would have faced off. But it's cool to see this common uh, fight scene also represented now in Animal Crossing. Yeah. So oh, which, which, uh, 
which um where do you land on the predator versus scavenger uh uh debate there with, with t-rex i know that that that's i i'm i'm gonna stop talking after this i think because i'm just exposing my my layperson's uh um uh lack of knowledge generally yeah. about where we're at in modern uh fossil exploration but i know that there was something related to whether or not t-rex could actually do damage or was just going around chowing down on on leftovers yeah i mean i don't i know that there are hot takes on both sides of that argument but i personally think that it would be it's kind of a stretch to assume that the t-rex would be able to find enough to eat as a scavenger alone and why have evolved like these amazing uh ferocious teeth and like the agility that it would have had like there's just no way it was just like a scavenger like this thing could have hunted you down so i think for sure i think they just ate anything and everything like whether it was already dead (laughs) if they had to go kill it they were gonna go mow it down like i don't know i wouldn't have messed with t-rex yeah i mean it's kind of like the debate that a lot of people have about uh, you know sharks in the ocean right now the modern you know sharks that we have where you have sharks like great white sharks who are obviously incredible hunters but it's not like they're going to pass up an opportunity to be scavengers as well so like why why are you trying to just just put it into a one box when they can occupy both of them no and that it's very true emily there there are many many videos of um dead humpback whales for example being scavenged by uh great whites and uh, great whites coming up and taking big old bites out of uh out of those meals that they find out there so yeah i mean why not apply that same logic to to a t-rex there awesome yeah. well we i mean we've done a pretty we haven't even talked about everything in this room obviously we might have to end up doing <laughs> you know another another round of this but uh is there anything else that we want to mention before we head over to uh to some more more modern things what do we think um well one thing that i i, I do want to point out here with the t-rex um uh, someone mentioned to me is that it is actually modeled off of one of your famous fossils at the Field Museum there. Emily, it's modeled after Sue. Yeah. We got Sue. That's so awesome. Can you can't you introduce us to, to Sue? Who is Sue? Oh yeah. Sorry, yeah, so excited to see about divers. Um, <laughs> so We all do, yeah. <laughs> so Sue Sue is the the largest, um, most complete Tyrannosaurus Rex fossil ever excavated and was uh, discovered outside of the tiny town of Faith, South Dakota, where coincidentally my family is from. What? No way. My dad. Oh, oh, what? Yeah. Yeah. So my dad is a rancher from Faith, South Dakota, and Sue was found on the neighbor's ranch about five miles north of where where my yeah. dad has his Ouch. ranch. <laughs> Yeah. That is so, so that's cool. Part of the reason I'm I'm doing a, a PBS series about paleontology, um, and yeah, so so she was uh, 66 million year old uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex fossil, um, and was found by an Orlin by the name of Sue Hendrickson, who uh, it was their last day of prospecting for dinosaurs, and they hadn't done much, and she sort of wandered outside the area where they had been looking for your fossils and saw two eroding out the side of a riverbank. So back to what I was saying earlier about how to find fossils. That's, that's how Sue was found. That's amazing. That's so that's cool. Cosmic, almost. That's very cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty wild. So like I, I grew up with my grandparents and like my dad sort of obsessed with the whole story behind Sue and how, because it sounds so close to where where we were from that is awesome <laughs> man that is something there are so many different things here i'm just gonna i'm gonna be processing the rest of the day just thinking about how great that is oh great job sue awesome Yay. keeping it in the family basically yeah yeah it was fun when i got my job at the field museum i told my grandpa that they hired me to take care of sue which isn't really <laughs> true but um you know it was a nice thing yeah my grandpa <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, and you can you can also follow us on Twitter uh, at Suzy Rex. They have a great Twitter Twitter account. Very snarky, very fun. <laughs> we we love oh, yeah, Sue. So, yeah. 
Right. I love this room because it is it does like evolutionary like link for all the people who are gonna come live on your island. It's so right? like cool. Like there are cow people, like link to the, their ancient relatives, and then you get to come all yeah. the way over here. You have like the whoa little Look at koala that. and everything. That's amazing. And then it lights up when be... you stand over there. Yeah. <sighs> Oh my goodness! We're okay. This is actually some. It, it, welcome to uh, our our gaming stream, everybody. You're actually finding a few <laughs> little Easter eggs right now there. So if you were trying to figure out the game mechanics of Animal Crossing, there's one. Stand yeah. there, and the light turns on. Yeah, we always joke here that <laughs> we uh, did it. Yeah, this stream Pro is tips. <laughs> is not if you want to watch someone play Animal Crossing well. This is not the stream for you. Uh, but if you <laughs> yeah. want to have fun when you're when you're watching an Animal Crossing stream, then then that's what we're here for. Yeah, yeah, we're like we're like an anti we're like an anti gaming stream where it's all about <laughs> how long we can spend just talking about things without accomplishing any of the major uh, major actions that move us forward. Oh, and this is now like we're at a lecture with with uh, with Emily oh, Grass. Yeah. <laughs> this is awesome. Okay. So okay, here class. Here on my right to your left, <laughs> you have um, actually this this fossil. I can't remember what they call it in the game. Yes. Yeah. I think it's their, uh, it's a, it's a, a kind of bronothere, um, which is like an ancient roe-like animal. They, they found these, they find them in the badlands of South Dakota. So, again, let's show that I'm doing a historic road trip that's coming out this summer on PBS. Tune into a station near you. Um, <laughs> like one of the things that, yeah, like and subscribe. One of the things I love about it is that in western South Dakota, you can drive through two billion years of the fossil record in Whoa. two hours. Yeah, it's amazing. Like the geologic diversity represented um, east of the Rocky Mountains, but um, west of western South Dakota, essentially. It's like unlike anywhere in the world. So you can find, well, like through the T Rex, you could find mammoths, and you can find these guys, the uh, uh, brontosaurus, which are like 50 million years old. So you get like just mm -hmm. tens of millions of years represented in this geologic record. And it's super cool. It's. I'm really lucky I have family who uh, live in South Dakota as well. And that's uh, one of my favorite things is just like driving from one side of the state to the other side of the state. Um, it's, it's like traveling through time. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty fun. I'm a fan. <laughs> Someone asked, why are Love. museums so dim? That's a good question. They have to preserve a lot of the specimens. Uh, don't like, they that's don't like exposure question. to light and it can be bad bad for long-term exposure so keeping the lights low is good it's also energy efficient you know like you got a huge building with a lot of light bulbs you want to keep the energy energy low um i also saw there in uh in chat emily uh someone was uh looking at the megaceros here uh was wondering if those are horns or antlers and what are the differences if you uh, oh if that's you a want. great question yeah they're antlers. Um, and so antlers are different than horns. So actually, this is a cool side-by-side -side comparison. So the bronothier to the viewer's left would have had a horn, but the horn is made out of keratin. Well, actually, this one has, like, horny protrusions on its nose. Um, but normally, like, the sheath of a horn, like a rhinoceros, is made out of keratin, like what your hair and fingernails are made out of. And uh, so that would have been attached to the skin. It wouldn't necessarily have grown out from the skeletal tissue. But like your antlers, those are made out of bone, but they're mm -hmm. shed. Mm -hmm. And so they grow back every year. And some animals like antelope, like pronghorn, have a combination of horns and antlers where they have a bony protrusion that's covered in a keratin sheath and is shed. So it's like a combination of a horn and an antler. Oh, whoa. Yeah, so cool. nature man. <laughs> That'd be a, a a handler, or a, what's the or an antlorn? What's the? I have no idea. I, okay. yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I guess they call them. I guess they call them antlers. I don't know. I, no, no, that doesn't make any sense. Because they must be horns. If a pronghorn is, yeah, they call it a horn, right? It's a pronghorn. <laughs> okay. Why? Why am I overthinking this? I'll take it either way. Uh, one uh, in the chat, people were mentioning that, like, yeah, um, something else you uh, you folks might be familiar with with uh, with a keratin, like uh, like your hair, 
is uh, whale baleen. So yeah, they um, basically missed a seat uh, for the baleen whales. Those are basically mustachioed whales. Is uh, is the name there? Missed a seat. The ones with the with the mustaches inside their their mouth there that help them sift out krill and other food there from the from the water column. Their big giant pasta strainer there in their mouth. So yeah, you'll find keratin lots of different places they are used in many many different ways uh in the animal world there so yeah great job in the in the chat there making some yeah. connections there between the fossil and the ocean well done oh, yeah. well, well done that. well done well done everybody <laughs> we hit 20 we hit 20 puns we got Oof. well i i have another pun but it it really applies to the the previous room so when we go back okay. through there we go back in yeah we can go back we can go back in um, unless we want to talk about mammoths. Emily, how, how do you do feel it. about mammoths? You want to know the difference between a mammoth and a mastodon? One way that you can tell them apart? Yes. Sure. Is, is if you have their teeth, they're kind of hard to see the teeth on this one. Um, but mammoths and mastodons are related. They're uh, protodians, so they're both in the elephant family. Um, related to elephants today, even. But uh, mammoths. Uh, have molars that are sort of like uh, long, flat teeth with a grinding surface surface on them. But mastodons have teeth that have like cusps on them. They have ridges, uh, and they look a little bit more like for eat, they're omnivorous, so eating shrubs and, and that kind of thing, and not necessarily just chewing grasses. So mastodon, when they when early scientists found them, they named them mastodon, which is Greek for breast-shaped tooth because of the mound <laughs> on their teeth. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, so if you really? find a tooth and it, you're like, this is vaguely elephant-like, but it looks also like a boob, I guess it's the mastodon. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. That really changes my perception of old school Power Rangers, too. <laughs> that's that's going to make rewatching that a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So like, oh. Wow, really, guys? Rest like tooth. Okay. Oh, we've got a lot. I mean, nothing we can say, I think, officially, Emily, but I don't know if you're looking in the chat all the different yeah. options that chat is coming up with for Mastodon <laughs> teeth. These are all hilarious. <laughs> yep. Oh, my goodness. Well done, chat. Wow. So instead of molars, are they mammalers? Or I don't know. <laughs> That's hilarious. Man, I can't read any of these, but oh goodness, are they hilarious? <laughs> to any of the parents that happen to be tuning in, we have no control so over sorry. over chat. Chat is its own entity. We are just here to provide the facts, and the world responds as it w as it will. <laughs> yeah, leaving everything up to interpretation. Wow, amazing. Oh dear. <laughs> wow, Mastodon yeah. gets dunked on in 2020. Is uh, yep, <laughs> certainly. <laughs> That's amazing. I had no idea. But I, I, I figured that Mastodon and Mammoth were just uh, synonyms of each other. So many different things in the no, fish world are no. like that, where you have bass, like a bass or a uh, or a snapper could be seven different fish families, depending on where you are in the ocean. So I figured that's what it was. But no, now we know. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's yeah, gonna... Mammoth and Mastodons are, are genetic. I mean, they're related, but they're they're distant uh, cousins, actually. Gotcha. Um, well, that's going to overshadow that my a... bad pun over here. I was just going to say, Emily, um, yeah, with, uh, with Sue basically being from your backyard, does that mean that she has sedimental value to you? Oh, that's pretty funny. I'll give you <laughs> a clap for that. Thank you. Emily, I had, Thank uh, you. I, I had, a, I had another one from this room where you're talking about Quetzalcoatlus only being known from its, uh, from its humorous. Uh, that's how we know it was a comedian because we only found its funny bone. It's humorous. No, yeah. does that work? Yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll yes. count it. We'll count it. Uh, <laughs> we did it. Uh, nice. Humorous. Okay. You right. know, one fossil you get to look forward to is I noticed the trace fossil over here, the footprint. Um, the study of trace fossils is called ichnology, I C H N O L O G Y. Um, but also you get another trace fossil on the island. You get a coprolite. Do you, you all know what a coprolite is? Yes. Oh, we I talked a little bit about this on, uh, yeah, we talked a little it's, bit about uh, this on the last stream. Yeah. Go for it, Emily. Yeah. So fossil, fossil called coprolite. Um, 
And so you'll be able to find a big old fossil poo somewhere around your island. Although, my, uh, if you had had it on display, I'd point out that it looks a little more viscous than is reasonable. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's very so true, though. <laughs> so it wouldn't have been as uh, floppy. Yes. Uh, true cropper life. Yes. Um, that, is, that is exactly why we wanted to have you on this on this stream, uh, <laughs> Emily, is you're, you're someone who can adequately provide feedback on the viscosity of a cropper light on exhibit. It's something that few people in this world are able to do. That's why we wanted you on the stream. That's, that's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> one, of my, one of my favorite true, like, real-life museum examples of, of paleontologists sticking to accuracy is that with the new Sioux exhibit at the Field Museum, there's this um, movie that plays in the background, like on these screens in the back of the exhibit that you can watch. And at one point in this 20-minute long video, Sue poops. Like, Sue takes a big old steamy dump on the side of a river. <laughs> and it's like a two-frame, like a flop of a poop. And I asked how many times it came up in, like, the, the exhibit developer meetings about, like, the consistency. Like, what is the rate? What is the volume of material that is being pooped? Like and so there was just there was like meaningful discussion about making sure that when Sue poops in the video, it's as accurate as as possible. That is so, so delightful. That's amazing. I want everybody oh. to know that being a scientist can have its its truly glamorous oh. moments as well. Oh, don't worry, Emily. If it's I mean it's not a a real stream with Patrick and I if poop is not brought up at least once. So <laughs> this is oh, on, this is par for the course right no, now. We've... We, we've often, you know, we've often talked about working at the aquarium and our animal care is very, it's basically uh, looking at your food before, during and after your animal is pretty much what, what your, <laughs> what your caretaking uh, ends up being. So we do talk a lot about uh, different ways that our animals um, do keep the nitrogen cycle going. So I'm glad that your scientists were really thinking about, about that in designing the new zoo exhibit. Now I have to go, I feel like. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Field people in the chat yeah. are appreciating this dump of information by the way um <laughs> people are saying. Oh somebody asked uh, someone in the chat asked um if i wanted to buy like upper lights or buy um living bird poo and that's a really good observation because we know birds today are living dinosaurs uh, they're mm -hmm. related to, to extinct dinosaurs here uh, and and you know I think there's probably a combination of both, but I think copper lights probably informed quite a bit of the uh, reanimation of the dino poo uh, action. That's very interesting. Yeah, because that's something we oh. talk about with our with our seabirds uh, in terms of the in terms of their poo is that we often see you know the white and the brown uh, on the rocks, and that's something we talk about as far as uh, with seabirds. Um, they have very concentrated poo because they want to hold on to that fresh water. They're getting most of it from their food. So they, um, they use uh, uric acid instead of urea that we have, which requires a lot of water to eliminate as a, as a waste. So um, fishes have plenty of water around them. So they basically have ammonia coming directly out of, their, um, out of their systems. And birds concentrate their water by having the uric acid and then the poop. So for those of you folks out there, if you ever have your car detailed, uh, uh, buy one of those birds. The white stuff is actually bird pee, and then the the brown stuff in the middle is the is the poo that you all can relate to. But it's a water mm -hmm. concentrating mechanism for birds there. And so uh, the next time that um, you know you have to clean a little bit of that off, you've got a little science fact to make it all better. There you go. Wow. The water quality oh, okay. is now very excited. Yeah, water quality team yeah. getting here. That is actually something we have to <laughs> deal with a lot: is how much poop is it's in our true. water from the birds. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. There. <laughs> Um, behind the scenes of many of our bird exhibits, we do have these huge, huge protein skimmers. And um, one of the reasons why we don't do a lot of like behind the scenes streaming or anything back there is because they are so loud. Um, but they have to continually have those filters going uh, because of how much poop the birds produce in the water so water quality Whoa. team is there just making sure that the birds and the water are are in good condition and doing well and uh thank you thank you for <laughs> thank you for dealing with with our birds poop all day absolutely go team water quality. go team water quality yeah hashtag team water quality um well well we 
we we didn't yeah, know about a, a lot of, with the fossils. I didn't know if Emily, you just wanted to kind of hang out with us for a little bit. We can do a little tour of the aquarium side with you, or um, if there's anything else that you want to do on the island while you're with us today. Let's do, yeah, let's let's pop over and and see some of the fish. Let's do it. Fish time. Fish time. Very excited. We're heading over to the aquarium here. And for those of you who are uh, still here on the stream, thank you so much for being uh, here. This is the Monterey Bay Aquarium social media team partnering up on Animal Crossing with Emily Grassley of the Field Museum and the Brain Scoop. And uh, now we are in an aquarium that uh, we really, really like uh, yeah. as far as exhibit design goes um, because it showcases these animals in their ecosystems and their habitats that you would uh, tend to see them. We got both freshwater, saltwater, deep sea, kelp forest, so many different habitats uh, split up there for all of the animals yeah. to go. And um, Emily Simpson, I'm going to let you lead the way as this oh. is your island here <laughs> for however things No, I was up. just going to uh, point out to uh, chat since we have so many uh, new people who are tuning in with us. Hello, Franz. Hello, new Franz. And hello, Franz, who have been with us uh, for a while. Um, we have only been playing uh, Animal Crossing as the aquarium for a short while, so our museum does not quite have a lot of fish. We missed all of the March fishes um, uh, when building our, our aquarium here, but uh, hopefully that's going to get built up over the next couple of months here. So uh, we're going to keep on checking back in, keep on fishing, and keep on bringing you uh, all, the, all the neat critters here. Um, one of my favorite critters happens to be sitting on, on the log right there, a little snapping turtle bud. Um, we haven't named, oh, yeah. we haven't named it yet, Patrick. I know that we've been, we've been naming some of the animals, uh, in the, in the, uh, game here so far, like our hamster. Um, I can't remember what we named her. What did we, what did we name our hamster? Pun the hamster. Pun, yeah, that's right. Pun the hamster. Of course. It was pun the hamster. It's pun yeah, the hamster. Puns. Um, should we name her Snapping Turtle? Teenage Mutant Somebody, Ninja? Somebody suggested Snip Jazz Man, and I love that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's it's decided. Snip Jazz Snip Man. Snip Jazz Man. Jazz Man. I, we'll take it. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. And actually, this is a, a this is a perfect thing that I don't I don't think we adequately. Uh, I, I don't I mean I forget we've been we've been talking now about natural history for so long so many amazing facts went by but a turtle is a really great transition for us to maybe go from fossils and dinosaurs over to uh, over to fishes because we talked about Tiktaalik yeah. um, as uh, yeah, as sort yeah. of a, a land fish um, can can we talk maybe about what's the difference between a turtle a reptile uh, those herps and dinosaurs like what's what what what's going on there I know we've talked about how you know they're birds um, or birds or dinosaurs like let, let's let's dispel some myths here about turtles dinosaurs uh let's let, let's get that over with so whoever feels like taking that it's emily grassley okay, okay. <laughs> um i don't have quite the the wheel of life totally figured out when it comes okay to all those. Uh, i will say turtles and tortoises basically the same thing but it's more like some of these distinctions are by habitat with habitat that they live so like you think about the difference between a turtle and a tortoise much, you're thinking about turtles are aquatic animals like uh living in a freshwater or a marine um habitat and tortoises are, are probably going to be large excuse me largely on the land um uh, largely terrestrial mm -hmm. uh so it's it's they're related in in many ways like evolutionarily they just sort of like occupy different habits and then uh, partitioning from there. Um, yeah, if you really okay. want to go yeah, like on a, a deep dive into reptiles, the evolution. I mean, dinosaurs were ancient reptiles. Yeah. The, if you want to get like really nitty gritty with the differences between tortoises and turtles, a lot of it has to do with the shape of the scoots on their back. Um, tortoises tend to have more pronounced scoots. Those are little plates on their backs there. Yeah. Um, uh, versus turtles, which usually have kind of a low profile back. It also has to do with um, their feet, what they look like, and whether or not they can kind of retract them into their shell or not. So, um, yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. That's okay. 
That's yeah, coming sorry from for your, just throwing, throwing no. a, a question out there that, to a grinding halt there in our conversation. No, it's uh, just there. It was a very. Snip Jasmine got me excited. Yes, yeah, Snip Jasmine got you excited <laughs> there for a good reason because, you know, when, when we talk about differences between animals, um, you just happen to throw out a, a very wide diversity of animals there, Patrick. I did, yeah. So to I be did, like, yeah, no, I know, it, like Emily and I, we kind of like said. focused in on like turtles and tortoises. Let's talk about the difference between those. But then, you like, when you talk about the differences between turtles and other reptiles, and reptiles and and dinosaurs, uh, you and know what? yeah, it, you get I, <laughs> you get a little deep I take there. It back. You know, I think I think we did a really good job, and I think that you know next time I'll just be like, hey, why don't you describe the entirety of the tree of life? I'll, I'll save that question for like, for a different for a different stream. <laughs> uh, but do we want to do we want to move on from um, from this room of uh, of shame? Maybe I'll find a better no, question. No, well, I was uh, just gonna. Start. I know no, that, that was we. That's a good question. Yeah, okay, it's right. a great question. Uh, um, can I also point out that the snapping turtle would not typically be hanging out on top of a log no like, absolutely this not animal, this animal <laughs> no is snip this snip is, is not happy yeah snip jasmine is not not in his preferred space right now uh, um snip jasmine's preferred space is like a, a dirty ditch on the side of the road you know <laughs> like that he can be right. completely submerged in and bite your toes when you wander in yeah on give him all that murky water and he'll be a happy happy turtle there um yeah. if jazz man is like water quality did too good on my end over yeah here. yeah water water quality team if you could if you could lower your standards for just a moment for uh for snip jazz man that'd be um people are asking for a snip uh a snip emote uh, when we yeah <laughs> when we get yeah, partners we, use your help we are that. gonna do a snip emote um one thing that i will uh i was gonna plug um because we've plugged, you know, apps and and other resources uh, in the past. If you are interested in exploring the natural world around you, whether it's bird watching in your backyard using the Cornell Lab of Ornithology's app, um, or you know, going tide pooling and using iNaturalist. Um, one thing, if you do want to explore kind of the differences between animals and and their relationships between them, and kind of the the whole. Uh, evolutionary history of life on this planet. Um, one of my favorite websites is called One Zoom. It's One Zoom Tree of Life, and you can actually like see on there. Like you can search for animals, and you can see what their closest relatives are, when they evolved, or when we think that they evolved. So far, as far as fossil histories and stuff go, um, but One Zoom Whoa. Tree of Life is one of my favorite uh, favorite it's websites. It's a great today. website. Yeah, it's, it's so much fun. Look this up. What is happening? Emily, you are oh, going to be the delighted. Way, oh. the, way, the way that they've designed it so that the Tree of Life is like fractals as you zoom in is it's just so, good. so yeah. yeah, One Zoom dot org is uh, what it is. I'll throw it up in, in chat. Or, yeah. yeah, one zoom.org. I'll put it in chat. Um, so that people hey, did you guys know that, that humans link. are related to chimpanzees? What? what? <laughs> Hold on. Hold the phone. This is a, this is a Twitch chat exclusive, everybody. <laughs> oh, that was the first one that came up, and I was like, this is amazing. Wow, that's awesome. That is, yeah. So oh, if yeah. you if you have time, it is such a wormhole to go down, but it is such a fun wormhole to go down. Um, it is, yeah, absolutely, and it'll and it'll show you that uh, that humans are, you know, technically fish as well as all the rest of uh, land tetrapods. Um, so I know that there's a huge battle over on Twitter between Team Fish and Team Bird, and everyone talks about how well birds are technically fish in the Tree of Life if you go down like really into the nitty gritty yeah. of all of it. So uh, it's really an amazing, amazing tool to be able to see how different things are connected. So one of my favorite things um, that I discovered with this long ago was the fact that the aquarium that um, albatrosses are more closely related to penguins, penguins. than to yeah. uh, to seagulls or gulls. You know, they, they look so similar and then you actually dive what? into it. It's like, oh, no, wait, they're actually um, penguins yeah. and uh, penguins and albatrosses are much more closely related. Gulls are a completely separate group of birds. They just have convergent evolution on their on their coloration, uh, but completely separate um, when you when you actually dive into the nitty gritty so a really really amazing amazing website to look at yeah Yeah. for sure yeah that's so cool oh it's so neat to see that the coelacanth on one zoom is on a completely different tree of life than all the other bony fish right yes going looking at like the little fish yeah 
the copterigians, where are you at in the chat? Yeah. Let's see it. <laughs> Forget yeah. those actinopterigii. It's sarcopterigii all the way. The we do. <laughs> We've got enamel. Who else got enamel? <laughs> no one. <laughs> Oh, this gosh. This is the nerdiest thing I've probably ever been Twitch streamed. <laughs> oh, I hope so. I hope so. Breaking, We're doing our job right. Yeah. Today. Oh, shoot. All right. Um, do, 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 have you caught a coelacanth in this game yet? Not yet. It hasn't rained on our island. Um, oh, yeah. I know. So that's the only I, oh. I think that that's the secret that Patrick does not know that is that you can only catch coelacanths when it's raining in Animal Crossing. So. It hasn't yeah, rained yet. As I, soon as it rains, we're gonna do like a surprise stream. I've I've decided by myself is that as soon as I notice that it's absolutely. it's raining on our island, we're going coelacanth fishing. Um, but one thing, um, yeah, one thing that I wanted to to point out here in the the little like open sea <laughs> um, exhibit, I call it the open sea because that's what we it looks like our open sea exhibit at the aquarium is just the it's so cute that they have the anchovies all schooling together and then there's one horse mackerel in there because it looks exactly the way that our kelp forest exhibit does where we have schooling anchovies <laughs> does. and then like one yeah. random mackerel in there that's just like I'm an anchovy too aren't I okay. Um, yeah, because <laughs> you know when yeah, they're because go ahead, Patrick. Yeah, go for it. No, you no, you do it. Take it away. No, so when uh, the anchovies came in, it's likely the horse mackerel, not the horse mackerel, but the the mackerel in our kelp forest uh, came in with those anchovies. It was just much smaller. And, you know, when you're out there in the ocean, uh, you don't really school based on what kind of fish you are. Uh, you're mostly just schooling with other fish that are about the same size and shape as you. So you see a lot of anchovies and sardines oh. schooling together. You often see uh, mackerel and other fishes that start off as small silvery fishes like an anchovy schooling together. And then as they get bigger, the fishes that do get bigger get bigger. They'll go off and school together with other fishes that look similar to them. Um, so it's likely that this mackerel came in with the anchovies as a smaller silvery fish just schooling along with the anchovies, but it kept on getting bigger and bigger. And now it's just this awkward <laughs> mackerel that's just swimming along oh. in, in our kelp forest exhibit right now. Yeah. Well, it's, it, yeah, I mean, it's it's so similar to, I think, a lot of human experience that uh, maybe some folks in the chat can, can relate to where, um, you know, everyone is in school around the same size and then some go through their growth spurt a little bit earlier and then start really yeah. kind of kind of standing out. I grew about six inches in uh, in a summer, just about, um, hey, and suddenly didn't fit yeah. in with the rest <laughs> of my, my troop there. And that's similar to the schooling fish where these silvery fishes that can be from completely different fish families uh, are all together uh, on the same team and then out of nowhere one of them just like oh wait I guess I'm a different I'm a different species entirely and then yeah and if you come to our kelp forest exhibit uh, and our open sea exhibit you'll often see uh, one-offs of fish that were in that group and then kind of had to find themselves after the fact uh, in, in the schoolyard trying to find someone yeah. who's their same size after yeah so, chat yeah, is suggesting a, that we really name cool. our, our mackerel here um, do we name well, it? It's got to be. Do we name it Bojack? It. Bojack Horse Mackerel. Uh, it, it could. It could be Bojack. <laughs> I was gonna go with Mac and the Boys from Cannery oh, that's Row. That's true too. We um, do that. Well, no, I, that's I what it Bo is. This is I, Mac. This is Bojack Horse Mackerel and his boys, the anchovies. Yes. Yeah. Bojack yeah. Horse oh. Mackerel and the Boys. <laughs> this is Bojack Horse Mac oh, and yeah. the Boys horse from Punnery <laughs> Road. Bojack Horse Mackerel. Everybody, let's get some W's in the chat for Emily right there. That was amazing. Oh my goodness. Oh, yes. this is excellent. I love it. Yes. All right, let's keep wow. on going. <laughs> wow, Bojack Horse Mackerel and the Boys. Uh, that is that is multiple layers of puns. I am so happy about that. <laughs> Are we heading over to the deep sea? Yeah. Yes. Look. I want to know where this, where the suit and the submarine came from. One day mine just showed up. Same. Like, what, yeah. What do? <laughs> Was it probably when you uh, got the deep sea, uh, your first deep sea fish? Did they arrive then? No, it, I think it came after, hmm. but maybe, I could be wrong. Maybe. Oh, maybe you had to catch an oar fish first and then they showed up. Well, well. What we'll we can go back to the timeline in this oh, exhibit. I don't have that little guy. <gasps> you, so that oh, little guy is, this is our newest the, addition. <laughs> oh, it's so my good. favorite. It yeah. is my favorite animal in this yeah. entire game because 
the fact that the, the, the game developers included a barrel eye, sometimes known as a spook fish, in this game shows you that they are true connoisseurs of the coolest critters that you will find in the deep sea because the barrel eye is an animal that was actually discovered by the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute out here in our backyard of the deep sea uh, canyon that we have out here, the Monterey Submarine Canyon. And what you're looking at here with this particular fish um, is that it has these green orbs. Those are its eyes and those point straight up through its head. Its head has become a clear dome that it looks up straight through. So you might see those two little dots on the front. Those are its nostrils and its mouth. The green eyes are pointed straight up through its transparent head. And those green eyes are green because the, that is a filter that helps to knock out the ambient downwelling slightly blue light and helps to show bioluminescent light of its prey that might be above it. So it's basically like, um, it's like a polarizing filter for background light that's downwelling into the deep and only shows you the little pinpricks of light that might be from a bioluminescent uh, shrimp or, or a fish above it that it's gonna go up and try to eat. And those eyes are also movable. So it's looking straight up, looking for the, the shadows and the bioluminescent light against that background light. It's looking straight up. And then when it goes to grab its food, scientists have seen that the eyes rotate forward in the head so that then it can hunt just like a quote unquote regular fish to be able to grab its meal. But so this is one of the most amazing fishes that we have discovered out here in the Monterey Bay and by the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. And the fact that it's in this game is just a true sign that people understand just how amazing the world is that we that we have out there, the amazing wildlife that we have on this planet that we get to explore. And uh, it's that I mean, that's part of the reason why it's like, all right, we gotta get we gotta get yeah, on we stream, gotta we gotta share this with the world. It's so great. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, it's it's big floppy it's big it's pelvic fins. fins. Yeah. So those are its pelvic yeah. fins down why? there. Um, it helps with uh, buoyancy regulation. So, you know, you figure the more wow. surface area that you can kind of spread out, um, you can be more neutrally buoyant basically that way to kind of regulate, you know, you'd spread those out in the water, keep them out big and wide, then you aren't going to sink down. Um, and then you can paddle around with them in the deep sea, get yourself uh, where you need to go. But yeah, that's, you know, spread those big fins out and then you won't sink as you're floating around looking up in the water column, trying to find your next meal. That's Absolutely. awesome. I just it, think that they're adorable is. too. They look really reminiscent of, uh, the, the pelvic fins on, um, giant sea bass when they're young. Uh, that's one of them. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. It's so cute. Yeah, just think about think about the the tens of millions of years of natural selection and selective adaptation that allowed for that animal to become so well adapted to the environment that it lives in now. Yeah. Yeah. Like just, that's amazing. And, and there are so many of these adaptations in the deep sea that end up being found across so many different phyla, like that green filter that goes over the eyes to be able to find bioluminescence against the background light because there's a lot of fish out there like lantern fish that have photophores on their bellies that are emitting about the same wavelength of light as what's surrounding them so it basically knocks out their shadow it's sort of like if you were standing in front of a tree and you could just have little lights on your belly little lcd screen that could just show tree to the rest of the world and what this filter does is just knocks out everything else around and then you can kind of see oh well that that background light is actually being made by by these by these organs and that green filter um, is found not only in the barrel eye but also in the strawberry squid which is known um, uh, as well as the cockeyed squid because it has one massive massive green eye that looks straight up doing the same thing trying to find that bioluminescence above it and then a tiny little bluer eye that looks down to see if maybe predators or other things might be coming up at it. So um, you've got a mollusk and you've got a fish that are doing the same thing. So again, that evolution, that natural selection that happens in the deep sea. And one of the things that that has done is 75% of the animals that the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute has found in the deep sea here in our backyard, 75% of them make their own 
light, so they're bioluminescent. And so if you consider that the deep sea is the largest habitat on the planet, three quarters of the animals that we found in our backyard make their own light, it shows that actually being bioluminescent, producing your own light, is maybe more of a common thing for earthlings than not. Um, and so these animals live in a dark world that we think about, but it's not pitch black. It's dark surrounding, but there's light shows going on and different animals trying to figure out how to uh, take advantage of, of the light, hide from it, or uh, illuminate the, the light that's being made by other animals to catch themselves a meal. So uh, really an amazing world to think about this, this mm -hmm. inner space of planet ocean that we're just now discovering with all of these amazing animals. And so the fact that Animal Crossing has this type of critter um, really shows how the detail that they've had trying to, trying to share uh, those those mysteries of the deep, those wonders that we have out there in the ocean. Yeah. Um, we got a couple of requests. Sorry, my from... mind is so blown right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so great. It's so good, though. Um, I did see that we had a, a couple of requests from chat. Um, let's see here. How about first, let's talk about the oarfish. We, we had a request for oarfish yes. facts. And then I'm going to throw this question out right now just so you can start thinking about it. I know Patrick and I have answered this before, but if there was an update to Animal Crossing, what would be um, your number one thing that you would want to see, whether it's a fish, a fossil, or bug, or, or anything like that? So go ahead and noodle on that while Patrick and I talk about uh, oarfish here. Um, uh, the other friend here swimming with our barrel eye. Patrick, do you want to do you want to start? Oh, well, just to talk about the oarfish, that was, you know, um, something that has happened. Uh, thankfully, I I've learned a little bit better on this stream to, to stop talking more frequently. But the first classic uh, <laughs> experiment in uh, in our Twitch streaming of me just talking about something and then Emily being like, stop talking. We've just caught an oarfish. Uh, so the first major I think that's a um, clip fish on Twitch that we, <laughs> that we found on, on stream, uh, the king of the herring as they're, as they're known and the source as Blathers says of many stories of sea serpents, these animals can grow to be over 35 feet long or the biggest ones were around 35 feet. Um, we actually have a friend, uh, of ours, uh, uh, here in Monterey, Phil Lemley, who is at the Catalina Island Marine Institute, uh, down, um, teaching kids how to scuba dive and, and snorkel who uh, he and his colleagues actually found one of these oarfish back in the day, washed up on the shore. And uh, sea serpent is probably the best description of them. But the truly remarkable thing, you'll notice how ornate their dorsal fin uh, rays are and how uh, ornate their pelvic fin rays are. And it's thought that those move around and can act as fishing lures to try to bring in food there over to the big mouth that's at the front. And another amazing characteristic of the oarfish, you can see that waving dorsal fin that goes all the way down to the length of the fish. This can undulate, allowing the fish to swim straight up and straight down. So it's one of the few fishes that can swim tail down, up and down in the water column, just like in an elevator. So in terms of fishes, mm -hmm. sort of like the hummingbird of fishes in that their, their specific swimming style is just so unique, being able to go straight up and straight down with that undulating fin. They've been found uh, by ROVs and, and other um, deep sea mining operations for a long time. And they're truly one of those amazing, amazing animals that we see very, very rarely. But um, again, incredible adaptations for the deep. They have a silvery body that allows them to basically disappear in the background of the blue around them. So uh, many different adaptations for camouflage in the deep sea, that mm -hmm. silvery body uh, kind of makes them very, very difficult to photograph because they look basically the same color as the blue that's all around them. That's the oarfish, the king of the herring, as they're also known. Really awesome. Ooh. Take that, take yeah, that good bladders. Job. Take good that job. bladders, yeah. where, you, where are you at, huh? <laughs> one fact on the oarfish, one fact, really? Come on. I know, I feel that way every time. Well, don't even get me started with blathers and his, like, loads of insects. Like, ugh. Right. <laughs> oh, that. Like, that that kind of bad attitude is so like 1998 blathers. Yeah, the world we are in a biodiversity crisis. We need all hands on deck. Yeah. Yeah. Have you heard yeah. of a pollinator? Come on. <laughs> yeah. You like you like food and tequila blathers because you need to think insects and bats for both of those. Why do you hate agave plants, blathers? Let's talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, blathers. Oh, look at this. We're so cute. Yay. Can you take a picture? Yeah, I will take a picture because this is very, very cute. Are you going to? Okay, you're going to go over there. I will. 
I will scoot the camera that way. Let's see if I can get more of the fishes. This in is there. so great. There we go. There we go. That's the picture right there. That's the thumbnail picture right there. <laughs> that's, that's it. We did it. Wait. Okay. Hold oh on, Patrick. Goodness. You got to emote. You got to. You got to react to this with 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 something. There you go. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, look at those three happy, happy geeks right there. This is talking about fishes oh, and fossils. Oh. Only nerding out with 1,400 people <laughs> around the world. Thank you, by the way, to everyone yeah. who is still Holy moly. in the chat. Holy increasing mola. numbers of people coming and hanging out with us. <laughs> this is so awesome. Thank you so much for being there. Uh, while um, our mutual institutions are closed, it's so great to be able to have that same type of experience, uh, sharing all of this information about the world that we uh, that we live on. There's so many cool things out there. So thank you so much for being here on this stream. It's really, really awesome to see so yeah. many of you folks out there. It's so good to see so many people out there with us right now. All right. Yes, thank you. This has been so fun. This has I'm been so, so glad fun. That to... This game came out like right. And that it can bring so many people together. You can. It's, it's been so nice to connect with with people and just have that like moment of normalcy of just being able to interpret and and talk about these because this is what we would be doing normally you know we would be talking to people about all the animals and and the natural history of things anyways and to be able to do that with a video game is just it's so cool it's been awesome yeah i know it's when your your job is to like <laughs> nerd out about the stuff in your museum or your your aquarium in this case and like you can't do it it's just to have an outlet um, to share all of our appreciation of the natural world stuff. Cool. <laughs> yes. Yeah, there's a, a, a few people asking if we're going to do this again when we get more fish. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, a couple of people saying that we should play Subnautica. Um, yeah. That's a really great, um, Subnautica, a really great suggestion. Yeah, Abzu. actually, Subnautica launched yeah. at the Monterey Bay Aquarium on their live yeah. chat. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, one of our good friends, Brian, was there for the launch, the Twitch stream launch of the latest version of Subnautica. Awesome. Um, which was which was pretty neat. Um, but yeah, we have plans to uh, hopefully do more games, uh, more streams, inviting more people on. Um, so yeah, there is a big list that we had to send to get approval to to play. So. Um, Hopefully, but right now we're we're enjoying our our little aquarium in in Animal Crossing. It's been a delight. Um, yeah. Do, do we want to see bugs since Blathers hates them so much? Should we end yeah, our day we, with we bugs? Yeah, we want to see bugs, Emily. I had yeah. I had one quick story that I wanted to share about this barred knife jaw. Oh yeah, that please is here do. We haven't talked uh, about that yet. Yeah. Because the barred knife jaw, so the black and white uh, striped fish that you're seeing here in front of you. Uh, is actually a fish that is not local to the Monterey Bay area. It's usually found off uh, the coast of Japan uh, across the Pacific Ocean, but there were at least three individual barred knife jaws that were spotted within the last three years out here in the Monterey Bay that would have been ones that arrived as larvae um, uh, adrift on the various debris and other things that happened from the, from the great uh, tsunami that happened over uh over in japan many many years ago wow. um a lot some of that some of the drift that made its way over to our coast brought along with it a couple of species and one of those is this barred knife jaw so if you were a scuba diver over at the monterey breakwater hanging out in the shallows with the opali uh was this bright white and black fish that was actually um coming over from from uh from japan adrift on the currents there uh, and there was a, another one that was found off of a, a shale bed in the in the bay, and then there was another one in the Monterey Harbor. So that barred knife jaw, when we caught it, I was like, that's another Monterey Bay Aquarium a story, a Monterey Bay story of that connection between the ocean. So things that are happening over uh, across the ocean from us are connected to what's mm -hmm. happening over here, not only via the currents, as in the case of the barred knife jaw making its way over uh, in that in that way, but uh, the leatherback turtles that you might see over in Indonesia nesting, those are the same ones that come here to the Monterey Bay to eat jellies. The gray whales that you see uh, up in Alaska in the Bering Sea and down in Mexico in the breeding lagoons, those are the same ones that you see here uh, in, uh, in the Monterey Bay on their, on their migration. So uh, the barred knife jaw, they're just a story of connection between mm -hmm. us 
and uh, and our our colleagues uh, over in Japan working at their aquaria, um, and uh, and obviously the the natural history uh, or the natural world between us and uh, and the other side of the of the world connected in in many different ways. And that Bart Knife Jaw, a recent addition to the local uh, ecology, uh, or uh, at least our local um, Monterey Bay Aquarium that. That is out in the ocean, the actual Monterey Bay there. So yeah. anyway, Bard Knife Jaw, really want to mention <laughs> that because super cool fish. I got to see it diving out here. Welcome to the area. Very cool. Well, welcome, visitor. Welcome, you friend. Put, you need to put up a little welcome, a little welcome banner. <laughs> a little welcome sign. I do. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Ooh, that's right. Okay, I'll get right on that. <laughs> and I know that we have talked about like how excited we are about the uh, habitats and the ecosystems being shown off inside of the uh, Animal Crossing Aquaria, but... Um, if there is an update, if they could just remove the uh, what they call the zebra turkey fish, aka lionfish, from this beautiful kelp forest, uh, that would be wonderful. Put that lionfish where it belongs. <laughs> um, Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. The end. Let's go look at some bugs. <laughs> Do it. Ooh, someone just suggested in another stream. Uh, if you want to uh, join us. Uh, Emily again that there is a, a Jurassic World uh, game a Jurassic World evolution game um, oh my goodness I know Whoa. <laughs> we, we might have to do this Ooh. again yeah <laughs> I might have some more hot takes <laughs> oh, oh, oh we're all about hot takes with uh, with Emily on the stream yeah. I think that is that needs to be a recurring segment we've got the pun counter the hot takes let's do it <laughs> I need to make a, a hot takes command. Uh, we've got the pun command, but we don't have a hot takes command yet. That's right. Scorching hot yeah. takes about bugs and I, yeah, I think my, the dinosaur game. My overall biggest disappointment in this whole game is just Blathers' poor attitude when it comes to insects. It's just like, just irresponsible, you know? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> that's, that's my sentiment on the whole thing. Like, I mean... True. There's so it's many true. fascinating it's things true. about like the insects and the hermit crabs and all the other like cool critters that you can find on the island. Um, and like, how could you be upset with butterflies? They're some of the more um, beautiful organisms to ever evolve. And they're Not so blathers. important. Yeah, with yeah. absolutely. Yeah. No, when what? Yeah, blathers needs to understand that when he has a platform that reaches millions of gamers, that he can really influence an entire generation <laughs> into thinking that bugs are for some reason. You just need to be more responsible with that platform, Blathers. He uh, he I has. Kind of, I mean, to be honest with you, I I feel, I truly feel that way. But it's also like I take it per really personally as well. Like mm. it's a personal failure on my my own work that I haven't been able to convince whatever game developer wrote the like character <laughs> you know summary for Blathers and like failed to find any endearing. Well, that means that for Animal Crossing. The newest horizons, they're, they'll they'll have a patch there, hopefully for <laughs> for in a, um, a six legged uh, six legged Blathers character or some some character that comes in and transforms his his belief. Maybe he finds love and it's a bug character. It'd be that'd be a good That's story true. arc there for. That's true. I can oh, only so imagine also people, the chat's pointing out that he was traumatized and that I'm being too hard on Blathers. So maybe that may be. That may be. You know what? Maybe. Again, scorching hot takes don't need to be correct. They just need to be piping hot when they come out. So yes. <laughs> perfect. Flick for museum intern. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Flick for museum intern. Boom. Yeah, there, there we go. go. Problem we solved. solved. Yeah. Chat <laughs> solved it. Game developers, if you're watching, Flick Museum intern. I, d I love this little butterfly pavilion it's very sweet it's very sweet it's so beautiful in there the little koi and the fountain and everything i do appreciate the one thing that i do appreciate though about blathers is that he is categorizing hermit crabs as bugs because they are they're sea bugs um so i do appreciate yeah. that he, that he is educating millions of of people playing this game right now about the fact that hermit crabs are are just sea bugs it's, it's How did just... you get this little cricket guy? Ooh, wait. Where are you? I have to find you again. We're, we're upstairs. Oh, the mole cricket? Yeah, uh, where when... did this guy come from? Yeah, so when you're listening to the sound in-game and you hear the, the cricket, the little... Um, 
Find where it's loudest and dig a hole. <gasps> I didn't know. Whoa. Yes. Pro Gamer what? Tips. Pro Gamer Tips with Emily. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Hashtag Pro Gamer Tips with Emily. Can you get some W's in the chat? Hashtag Pro Gamer yeah. Tips. Yeah. yeah. So those That's are the awesome. little mole crickets that you can get. Yeah, and I haven't uh, gotten the, the ants or the flies yet, but if you leave trash out... Um, that's how you can get ants and flies. I got a fly. I got flies. I left that out in my cans out uh, the, the front of my house. And, uh, like, I expected the trash man to come or something. And uh, <laughs> um, happened. I got ice. Um, if you do buy a trash can in-game, you can throw things away. Wow, Patrick. Wow. Wow. What did I just, do? You just pushed me out of the way. <laughs> do you not see that? Oh. <laughs> no, I, I didn't. I was... I was, watching, so I was watching the chat and I was just running. You're I'm so sorry. so focused on. Listen, there, there will not I'm be a single episode where I'm over here having, a, having my, a delightful conversation with Emily. Yeah. yeah, here. Start talking about something. I'll push you out of the way again. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> just running from you. Just. Uh-oh. Ah. Uh -oh. Yeah. There we go. No, OBS, uh, OBS link here is starting to tell us that it can't handle the I awesome know. again. Yeah. It's all good. <laughs> it, it, somehow it does that about at the the two hour mark every single time, which it has been two hours since we started yeah, maybe, uh, playing. Maybe so. uh, maybe it's just getting overheated or something. Maybe maybe that's. But uh, uh, I, I did want to mention just very quickly when Blathers does call um, crayfish and uh, and hermit crab sea bugs, um, he's mentioning the fact that they are arthropods, and as we've talked about on the stream before, mollusks are heavily featured in Animal Crossing, one of the most successful body plans to ever exist. Uh, in the ocean uh, and on our planet generally. Arthropods, another one mm -hmm. of the most successful groups of organism, one of the best body plans you could possibly have uh, if you wanted to survive on our planet, whether in the ocean or on land. So shout out to the mollusks as always, but shout out to the arthropods, <laughs> you segmented <laughs> wonders. Uh, you are doing fantastic yeah. with, uh, with with everything that you've, that you've been able uh. to accomplish on our planet so far. Someone in chat pointed out that Blathers must be behind OBS because he's he's like, oh no, bugs. We gotta stop this. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I guess we should head out of the museum. You know, this has been so lovely. It's been so wonderful oh, having you here with us, so Emily. Fun. Thank you so much for coming and, and nerding out with us today. Yeah, this is awesome. Thank you for inviting me and letting me come and check out your museum. I'm going to have to do a little bit more uh, more research on some of the other fossils, and maybe we can come back and have a, have a second go around. Absolutely. And get more hot takes. Anytime. Yeah, that'd be you awesome. are welcome here anytime. Just let us know. Yeah. Thank you. And thanks to everybody in the chat who tuned in. This is super awesome. It's, it was um, so cool I, to see so many people there. Yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, if people, I'll give a plug. If people want to learn more about the sort of stuff that I do, you can check out my YouTube channel. It's called The Brain Scoop. We make videos about natural history museums. And if you tune in to your local PBS station this summer, you can watch my three-hour-long documentary mini-series. Yes. yes. Trip. Yes. Woo! Prehistoric road trip. Three years, and it's gonna oh, be wow. out in I, like two months. I remember like seeing everything when when you first started, and 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 just saying like, oh, I have a big secret, like I can't tell anyone yet. And then uh, like finding out that it was a PBS documentary, I was I was very excited as a as an Emily Grassley fan um oh, to thanks. see everything and to see how hard that you've been working so i hope that it's a success and i oh, hope that God. lots and lots of people tune in to watch it Chuck, thank you guys you're so <laughs> nice to me oh golly oh, you've, you've been a science communication on the internet inspiration for so many years it's been really awesome to meet uh, you today and to go on this adventure uh, learning so much about fossils i feel enriched i feel energized about our natural world from this time uh, so yeah, absolutely. Uh, everybody go check out everything that Emily Grassley has been working on, uh, all of those things. And of course, if you want to follow more of us, we'll be, uh, Twitch streaming again, follow us on Twitter, uh, Instagram, Facebook, Tumblr, YouTube, Giphy, wherever it is, we're probably there. Uh, give us a follow and, uh, you'll know the next time that we do a live stream here with Animal Crossing nerding out about the natural world. Uh, 
Emily Simpson on yes. social media team here at the aquarium. Any final words here for conclusion? Oh, I think that you covered a lot of it there. Um, we'll try and do these as often as we can. Right now, we've been um, focusing on uh, streaming on Monday and Wednesday afternoons. Uh, so check out our Twitter. We'll have our schedule up when we're going to stream on there. Um, otherwise, every day of the week, we do have a different uh, animal webcam up on our Twitch stream. So you can always just tune in, tune on, and... Uh, I should say tuna in uh, to see Ooh. what animal <laughs> nice. I know. Got to get the, the, yeah. those last puns in there right now. Uh, yeah. See what, what else uh, we got streaming. Um, and I see lots of folks in chat right now uh, asking when the, the VOD is going to be available. It'll be available right after this. Um, we'll have it up and ready to go um, for everyone to check out. Um, lots of folks asking about emotes. We are and have been <laughs> actively working on trying to get everything set up uh, to become Twitch affiliates so that we can start getting those emotes for everyone. Some awesome aquarium emotes. Obviously, we need to have um, Snips Jazzman as an emote now. <laughs> we also <laughs> have to have uh bojack horse mackerel and the boys as an emote now as well so uh we are gonna the hamster yeah we yeah, gotta we, have pun the yeah. hamster as an emote we have so many things that we are working on um but we just uh want to take a quick moment to thank all of you for being here with us today to see that you know 1400 people were tuning in with us to learn about the animals um, it really warms our heart. Patrick and I, we have been working at the Aquarium. Patrick's anniversary, BT Dub, his nine year aquarium anniversary was on Saturday, Aww. and we didn't get to celebrate Aww. that or celebrate that. Aww. So um, lots of W's, lots of celebrations in the chat for Patrick, <laughs> who's been at the aquarium now for nine years. I've been at the aquarium for oh, seven years and and I'm so excited that the two of us have got to spend most of our careers together interpreting. Um, the natural world for so many people yeah. and um, when the aquarium closed that was a big part of our life that was missing and so to be able to do this with 1400 people here in twitch right now um, with emily here to to join us has just been so exciting so uh thank yeah. all of you for for being here and for letting us oh. uh, have this uh, fun fun time with you all this afternoon um, I can see OBS. Yeah, Blathers yeah, no. has taken OBS in rebellion for showing the bugs. Exactly. Um, it keeps on <laughs> flashing. I'm going to try and figure out what's going on again there. It was doing so well. It's that two hour mark that it just does not like. Um, so, just very quickly, last words. Um, just thank you again for being here in the chat on the stream with us today. Thank you, Emily, again for joining us today. Um, it's been so Thank delightful you. to have to have you with us here um, right now when the world is a little bit crazy and uh, uncertain we just want to remind all of you to just be kind to yourselves and to remember to be kind to each other and we will see you again soon here at the Monterey Bay Aquarium live on, on Twitch thanks for being here everyone thanks everyone yeah, thank, you. thank you for having me and everybody take care Take Bye. care, everyone. Stay safe.